guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here today with Henry. Hi! And today is our next presidential series installment, and we're going to take a look at who, Henry? Franklin Roosevelt. That's right, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, good old FDR. And Henry, what number president was he? The 32nd. That's right, the 32nd president of the United States. And we have some really amazing cool awesome things to tell you about franklin delano roosevelt but before we do that henry tell the people what they need to do it's down down below leave a comment question give a thumbs up hit the and you got it <laughs> you did it good job so you need to hit subscribe down below right subscribe to the channel leave all those comments and questions because we love those right henry yep we love the comments and questions we love the interaction with our subscribers and then of course Leave a like, a thumbs up, and hit the yeah. little notification bell. Yeah. Because that's going to notify you when we do release a new video. And Henry, tell the people when that is. Every single week. That's every single week. He's absolutely right. So now sit back. Because we're going to take a look in this next presidential series installment at the man behind us. Good old FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States. And this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ back here with you, here with Henry. Hi. And yes, the man behind us, who is it, Henry? Franklin Roosevelt. That's right. And what was his nickname? F? FDR. FDR, good job. Good old FDR. And yes, some really cool, awesome things to tell you about Franklin Roosevelt, such as, as many of you already know, he served as president longer than any other president in the history of our nation. That's right. Four years. That's right. Well, four terms. four terms. He actually served for 12 years. Yes. Yes. So he was elected for four consecutive terms. But unfortunately, in his fourth term, only about a month or two into his fourth term, he did die suddenly. So he didn't really get to complete that fourth term at all. But he did serve three full consecutive terms, 12 years in office. And then, of course, about five or six or so years after he died, they passed an amendment that did not allow any president to serve more than two consecutive terms. So that's it. No other president, unless there's a constitutional change or amendment ever that happens, unless that happens, there will never, ever, right Henry? Never, never be another guy or woman to ever serve Three. more or four terms. That's right, more than more than FDR did. That's yeah. the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So another really cool thing about FDR, well, it's not so cool. He actually contracted polio when he was in his 30s. Yes, and it actually put him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So unfortunately, FDR was disabled. He was in a wheelchair due to polio, which they're not even sure it was polio nowadays, but we're going to get into that. And he was so, so conscious of his image to the public that he made sure that he was never photographed or videoed in his wheelchair. As a matter of fact, there's only a couple photos of him in a wheelchair even in existence. Yeah. And he didn't even let them come out until well after he was dead. Yes, crazy. And then, of course, we're going to tell you about his sudden death during his fourth term, early on in his fourth term, and then the funeral, and then the burial site in Hyde Park, New York, only about two hours from us here yeah. in New Jersey. We're going to show you all that, the Roosevelt Estate there in Hyde Park. But before we actually get into the 32nd President of the United States, you did the likes, you did the subscribes, you left the comments, you left the questions, you did the notification bell. Henry, I should just go off screen. Take it away. God, tell them what they got to do. <laughs> Get the potato chips and soda and the popcorn. That is right. Get, that's right. Get the potato chips. Get the soda. Get the popcorn. Get the pretzels. Get whatever you want to snack on. Yep. And sit back and relax and watch as we take a look at the 32nd president of the United States, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Enjoy. Hey guys, it's Henry's Dead History. I hope you enjoyed the video with us. After your Franklin Delano Roosevelt, enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. 
TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next presidential series installment as we take a look at the 32nd president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. I am uh, flying solo for the audio portion of things. Uh, Henry might make a guest appearance here and there during the audio, but I am flying solo for the audio. Uh, we have a lot to go over, of course, with FDR. Uh, as many of you know, of course, uh, FDR uh, was into his fourth term. Yes, fourth, uh, when he uh, when he died in office. Um, yeah, so he was president for a long time. He was president for like 12 years or so. So uh, there's a lot to go over. Uh, he was the president during the uh, majority and bulk of World War II. Uh, of course, we have the New Deal. A lot of things to go over with Roosevelt. I intend on doing this in just two videos. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I don't think I'm going to do a third, but it all depends. I don't like part twos to be much more than an hour long, maybe a little over an hour, and that's stretching it. So if this gets into where I see it's going to be like an hour and a half or longer for part two or something... I'll stretch it into a shorter part three, um, but the plan is two parts. So, in part one, we're going to take a look, as we always do, of course, of the childhood, the early life, uh, you know, the marriage, the early political career, and that sort of thing of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and then I'll give you some facts about that stuff, and then if, part two, of course, is going to be the bulk of his presidency and fun facts and, of course, his death and his burial and his gravesite and that sort of thing. So, here we go. Jumping right in to good old FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born on January 30th of 1882 in the Hudson Valley town of Hyde Park, New York. About two hours, maybe two hours and 15 minutes from uh, where I live. Not far at all. He was born to businessman... James Roosevelt I and his second wife, Sarah Ann Delano. Roosevelt's parents, who were sixth cousins, both came from wealthy old New York families. The Roosevelts, the Aspinwalls, and the Delanos, respectively. Roosevelt's <clears throat> ancestors on his father's side, on the paternal side, <clears throat> migrated to New Amsterdam in the 17th century. And the Roosevelts flourished as merchants and landowners. The Delano family, <clears throat> Philip Delano, as a matter of fact, was his name. He traveled to the New World on the fortune in 1621. And the Delanos prospered as merchants and shipbuilders in Massachusetts. Franklin did have a half-brother, James Rosie Roosevelt, from his father's previous marriage. Franklin Roosevelt grew up in a wealthy family. His father, James, gradu graduated from Harvard Law School in 1851, but he chose not to practice law after receiving an inheritance from his grandfather, James Roosevelt. Roosevelt's father was a prominent bourbon Democrat who once took Franklin to meet President Grover Cleveland in the White House. I'm sure you guys remember that story from our Grover Cleveland uh, videos where uh, a very young Franklin Roosevelt met President Grover Cleveland and Grover Cleveland famously said to young FDR, whatever you do, don't become president. And the funny thing about that story, that was actually during... Cleveland's first term, not even his second term. So, pretty funny. Actually, here we go. I'm going to read it right here. The president said to him, Grover Cleveland, that is, my little man, I am making a strange wish for you. It is that you may never be president of the United States. Franklin's mother, Sarah, was the dominant influence in Franklin's early years. She once declared, my son Franklin is a Delano, not a Roosevelt at all. 
James, who was 54 when Franklin was born, was considered by some as a remote father. Though biographer James McGregor Burns indicates James interacted with his son more than was typical at the time. Roosevelt learned to ride, shoot, row, and play polo and lawn tennis. He took up golf in his teen years, becoming a skilled long hitter. He learned to sail early, and when he was 16, his father gave him a sailboat. A little bit about his, his education. Frequent trips to Europe, he made his first excursion at the age of two and went with his parents every year from the ages of seven to 15. It helped Roosevelt become conversant in German and French. Except for attending public school in Germany at age nine, Roosevelt was homeschooled by tutors until age 14. He then attended uh, Groton School, an Episcopal boarding school in Groton, Massachusetts. I don't know if it's Groton or Groton, Massachusetts. I think it's Groton. Joining the third form. Its headmaster, Endicott Peabody, preached the duty of Christians to help the less fortunate and urged his students to enter public service. Peabody remained a strong influence throughout Roosevelt's life, officiating at his wedding and visiting him as president. Like most of his Groton classmates, Roosevelt went to Harvard College. Roosevelt was an average student academically, and he later declared, I took economics courses in college for four years, and everything I was taught was wrong. He was a member of the Alpha Delta Phi fraternity and the Fly Club and served as a school cheerleader. Roosevelt was relatively undistinguished as a student or athlete, but he became editor-in-chief of the Harvard Crimson Daily Newspaper, a position that required great ambition, energy, and the ability to manage others. Franklin Roosevelt's father died in 1900, causing great distress for him. The following year, Roosevelt's fifth cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, became president of the United States. Theodore's vigorous leadership style and reforming zeal made him Franklin's role model and hero. Franklin graduated from Harvard in 1903 with an A.B. in history. He entered Columbia Law School in 1904 but dropped out in 1907 after passing the New York Bar Examination. In 1908, he took a job with the prestigious law firm of Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, working in the firm's <clears throat> Admiralty Law Division. So, that's kind of his childhood and his early, you know, uh, education, you know, through law school. He dropped out, he passed the bar exam, started working for this law firm, um, came from a very wealthy family. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt is one of those presidents that he did not, you know, come uh, from from poverty. He was not born in a log cabin. Uh, you know, he was not born uh, in, in, you know, basically in slums and 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 in poverty, or sometimes in severe poverty in some cases of presidents, and then rose the ranks. Um, he was a very very well off uh, and very very privileged uh, person. Uh, in his whole life, but especially, you know, growing up. He definitely uh, was born into a very wealthy family. So now uh, a little bit about his marriage, some some things about his family, uh, and then, yeah, we're even going to touch on some of the affairs. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt is uh, infamously known for his extramarital affairs, so uh, we will discuss that as well now. In mid-1902... Franklin began courting his future wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, with whom he had been acquainted as a child. Eleanor and Franklin were fifth cousins once removed, and Eleanor was a niece of Theodore Roosevelt. They began corresponding with each other in 1902, and in October of 1903, Franklin proposed marriage to Eleanor. On March 17th of 1905, Franklin Roosevelt married Eleanor, despite the fierce resistance of his mother. 
While she did not dislike Eleanor, Sarah Roosevelt was very possessive of her son, believing he was too young for marriage. She attempted to break the engagement several times. Eleanor's uncle, President Theodore Roosevelt, stood in at the wedding for Eleanor's deceased father, Elliot. The young couple moved into Springwood, his family's estate at Hyde Park. The home was owned by Sarah Roosevelt until her death in 1941 and was very much her home as well. In addition, Franklin and Sarah Roosevelt did the planning and furnishing of a townhouse Sarah had built for the young, cu young couple in New York City. Sarah had a twin house built alongside for herself. Eleanor never felt at home in the house at Hyde Park, in the houses, I should say, at Hyde Park or in New York. But she loved the family's vacation home on Campobello Island, which Sarah gave to the couple. Biographer James McGregor Burns said that young Roosevelt was self-assured and at ease in the upper class. In contrast, Eleanor at the time was shy and disliked social life, and at first stayed at home to raise their sev several children. As his father had, Franklin left the raising of the children to his wife, while Eleanor in turn largely relied on hired caregivers to raise the children. Referring to her early experience as a mother, Eleanor later stated that she knew absolutely nothing about handling or feeding a baby. Although Eleanor had an aversion to sexual intercourse and considered it an ordeal to be endured, she and Franklin had six children. Anna, James, and Elliot were born in 1906, 1907, and 1910, respectively. The couple's second son, Franklin, died in infancy in 1909. And another son, also named Franklin, was born in 1914. And the youngest child, John, was born in 1916. Roosevelt had several extramarital affairs, including one with Eleanor's social secretary, Lucy Mercer, which began soon after she was hired in early 1914. In September of 1918, Eleanor found letters revealing the affair in Roosevelt's luggage. Franklin contemplated divorcing Eleanor, but Sarah objected strongly and Lucy would not agree to marry a divorced man with five children. Franklin and Eleanor remained married and Roosevelt promised never to see Lucy again. Eleanor never truly forgave him and their marriage from that point on was more of a political partnership. Eleanor soon thereafter established a separate home in Hyde Park at Val Kill and increasingly devoted herself to various social and political causes independently of her husband. The emotional break in their marriage was so severe that when Roosevelt asked Eleanor in 1942, in light of his failing health, to come back home and live with him again, she refused. He was not always aware of when she visited the White House, and for some time, she could not easily reach him on the telephone without his secretary's help. Roosevelt, in turn, did not visit Eleanor's New York City apartment until late 1944. Franklin broke his promise to Eleanor to refrain from having affairs. He and Lucy maintained a formal correspondence and began seeing each other again in 1941, or perhaps even or earlier. Lucy was with Roosevelt on the day he died in 1945. Despite this, Roosevelt's affair was not widely known until the 1960s. Roosevelt's son, Elliot, claimed that his father had a 20-year affair with his private secretary, Marguerite Missy Lehand. Another son, James, stated that there is a real possibility that a romantic relationship existed between his father and Crown Princess Martha of Norway, who resided in the White House during part of World War II. Aides began to refer to her at the time as the president's girlfriend, and gossip linking the two romantically appeared in the newspapers. So, 
Franklin was quite uh, quite the uh, quite the uh, you know ladies man I guess and he was uh, quite the adulterer um, so yeah uh, have some fun things though here to show you so uh, I'm gonna get into that right here okay so I did touch on <clears throat> Lucy Mercer uh, who of course was with Roosevelt when he died uh, and was his mistress uh, I wanted to just read you this real quick American folk figure Lucy Page Mercer Rutherford she was the mistress companion of President Franklin Roosevelt. She was born to a prominent Maryland Catholic family. She had to go to work when her family fell on hard times. In 1914, she became social secretary to Eleanor Roosevelt, where she met and fell in love with FDR, who was assistant secretary of the Navy at the time. Eleanor learned of the affair in 1918 when she found a packet of letters from Lucy in her husband's luggage. The Roosevelts decided not to divorce, and Franklin agreed to never see Lucy again. However, there is evidence that they later resumed meeting. FDR got Lucy a front row seat to his 1932 inauguration. Lucy married Winthrop Rutherford in 1920 and had one daughter with him. Their marriage lasted until his death in 1944. She became a companion for FDR after the death of her husband and was with him in Warm Springs, Georgia, when he collapsed and died in 1945. Although she left before Eleanor arrived and heard the news of FDR's death on her car radio, she returned to her late husband's farm in Aiken, South Carolina, South Carolina, where she lived until her death. So the reason I'm telling you about Lucy uh, Page Mercer Rutherford is because now what you're going to see on your screen is photos of Lucy Rutherford's gravesite. This is actually at the Tranquility Cemetery in Tranquility, New Jersey. It's in Sussex County, and it is tucked away up in the northwest part of New Jersey, Almost to the Delaware Water Gap. Almost to the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. So it's up in the northwest part of New Jersey, in the middle of nowhere, up in the mountains, up in the farmlands, uh, Sussex County. I took a ride there just last week. Uh, so you're seeing photos of her gravesite on your screen now. And now, take a look at this video. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History. And I am actually at the Tranquility Cemetery in Tranquility, New Jersey, which is in Sussex County, New Jersey. Uh, this is in the middle of nowhere. I'm actually going to turn you guys around. That behind me, I will tell you that what that is in a second. But as you see, you know, nothing but beautiful mountains. Sorry about the blurry there, but I mean, it's, it's a uh, very, very... Little little cemetery. I mean, it's probably 2,000 or so graves, but 3,000 graves, maybe even more than that, but it's not huge. But you're in the middle of the mountains of New Jersey, in northwest New Jersey. I'm only about maybe 15 minutes or so from uh, from the Delaware Water Gap, where Pennsylvania, the like Pocono Mountains in New Jersey meet. So, And this right here at Tranquility Cemetery this third grave in right here this entire section here is the Rutherford family and right here it's actually the fourth I take that back the fourth one in where you see Winthrop Rutherford and then underneath Lucy Mercer Rutherford that is actually a uh, mistress of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, it's a very famous mistress of his that he carried on an affair with so that is where she's buried uh, right here in the tranquility cemetery in uh, tranquility new jersey so there you go that's just like a look at her grave site so pretty crazy pretty interesting stuff though because like i said this is in the middle of nowhere um you know pretty pretty out of the way place but pretty cool to see thanks for joining Thanks for watching. Um, the, th the thing that's cool about it, I mean, the fact that it's here in my home state, 
Um, the fact that she was with FDR when he died uh, down in Georgia. Um, it's just really cool. And the fact that it's tucked away in the middle of nowhere. I just love all. All the factors are awesome. Now listen, as far as Marguerite Missy Lehand, who was uh, his private secretary, Roosevelt's, uh, and there was uh, talk of them having an affair. As far as her gravesite, she's up in uh, Massachusetts. There is a chance that you might see a bonus footage of her gravesite. I don't know if I'm going to make it there, but we'll see. If you see bonus footage at the end of this video, you'll know what it is. Uh, and the other one that uh, one of his sons had said that uh, his father possibly had an affair with, the uh, Crown Princess uh, Mar Martha or Marta of Norway. Um, she's obviously buried in Norway, so <laughs> there's no way for me to go to her gravesite, but uh, pretty cool. Um, you know, not cool about the affairs, of course, but pretty cool and interesting uh, about seeing some of this stuff. So now, moving on to the early political career of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, the New York State Senator, he was a state senator from 1910 to 1913. So here we go. We're going to jump right into that. Okay, here we go. Roosevelt held little passion for the practice of law and confide, confided to friends that he planned to eventually enter politics. Despite his admiration for his cousin Theodore, Franklin inherited his father's affiliation with the Democratic Party. Prior to the 1910 elections, the local Democratic Party recruited Roosevelt to run for a seat in the New York State Assembly. Roosevelt was an attractive recruit for the party because Theodore was still one of the country's most prominent politicians and a Democrat Roosevelt was good publicity. The candidate could also pay for his own campaign. Roosevelt's campaign for the state assembly ended after the Democratic incumbent Louis Stuyvesant Stuyvesan? Chandler um, Stuyves Stuyvesant, I think it's Stuyvesant, uh, Louis Stuyvesant Chandler chose to seek re-election. Rather than putting his political hopes on hold, Roosevelt ran for a seat in the state Senate. The Senate district located in Dutchess County, Columbia County, and Putnam County was strongly Republican. Roosevelt feared that open opposition from Theodore could effectively end his campaign. But Theodore privately encouraged his cousin's candidacy despite their differences in partisan affiliation. Acting as his own campaign manager, manager Roosevelt traveled throughout the Senate district via automobile at a time when many could not afford cars. Due to his aggressive and effective campaign, the Roosevelt names influence in the Hudson Valley and the Democratic landslide in, 19, in the 1910 United States elections, Roosevelt won, surprising almost everyone. Though legislative sessions rarely lasted more than 10 weeks, Roosevelt treated his new position as a full-time career. Taking his seat on January 1st of 1911, Franklin Roosevelt immediately became the leader of a group of insurgents who opposed the bossism of the Tammany Hall machine that dominated the state Democratic Party. In the 1911 U.S. Senate election, which was determined in a joint session of the New York State Legislature, Roosevelt and 19 other Democrats caused a prolonged deadlock by opposing a series of Tammany-backed candidates. Finally, Tammany threw its backing behind James A. O'Gorman, a highly regarded judge whom Roosevelt found acceptable, and O'Gorman won the election in late March. Roosevelt soon became a popular figure among New York Democrats, though he had not yet become an eloquent speaker. News articles and cartoons began depicting the second coming of a Roosevelt that sent cold shivers down the spine of Tammany. Roosevelt, again in opposition to Tammany Hall, supported New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson's successful bid for the 1912 Democratic nomination, earning an informal designation as an original Wilson man. 
the election became a three-way contest as Theodore Roosevelt left the Republican Party to launch a third-party campaign against Wilson and sitting Republican President William Howard Taft. Franklin's decision to back Wilson over Theodore Roosevelt in the general election alienated some members of his family, although Theodore himself was not offended. Wilson's victory over the divided Republican Party made him the first Democrat to win a presidential election since 1892. Overcoming a bout with typhoid fever and with extensive assistance from journalist Lewis McHenry Howe, Roosevelt was re-elected in the 1912 elections. After the election, he served for a short, t- short time as chairman of the Agriculture Committee and his success with farm and labor bills was a precursor to his New Deal policies 20 years later. By this time, he had become more consistently progressive in support of labor and social welfare programs for women and children. Cousin Theodore was of some influence on these issues. There you go. So now leads us up to him being the Assistant Secretary of the Navy from 1913 to 1919. Roosevelt's support of Wilson led to his appointment in March of 1913 as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the second-ranking official in the Navy Department after Secretary Josephus Daniels. Roosevelt had a lifelong affection for the Navy. He had already collected almost 10,000 naval books and claimed to have read all but one and was more ardent than Daniels in supporting a large and efficient naval force. With Wilson's support, Daniels and Roosevelt instituted a merit-based promotion system and made other reforms to extend civilian control over the autonomous departments of the Navy. Roosevelt oversaw the Navy's civilian employees and earned the respect of union leaders for his fairness in resolving disputes. Not a single strike occurred during his seven-plus years in the office, during which Roosevelt gained experience in labor issues, government management during wartime, naval issues, and logistics, all valuable areas for future office. In 1914, Roosevelt made an ill-conceived decision to run for the seat of retiring Republican Senator Elia Root of New York. Though Roosevelt won the backing of Treasury Secretary William Gibbs McAdoo and Governor Martin H. Glynn, he faced a formidable opponent in the Tammany-backed James W. Gerard. He also lacked Wilson's backing as Wilson needed Tammany's forces to help marshal his legislation and secure his 1916 re-election. Roosevelt was soundly defeated in the Democratic primary by Gerard, who in turn lost the general election to Republican James Walcott Wadsworth Jr. Roosevelt learned a valuable lesson. The federal patronage alone, without White House support, could not defeat a strong local organization. After the election, Roosevelt and the boss of Tammany Hall machine, Charles Francis Murphy, sought an accommodation with one another and became political allies. Following his defeat in the Senate primary, Roosevelt refocused on the Navy Department. World War I broke out in July of 1914 with the central powers of Germany Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire seeking to defeat the Allied powers of Britain, France, and Russia. Though he remained publicly supportive of Wilson, Roosevelt sympathized with the preparedness movement, whose leaders strongly favored the Allied powers and called for a military buildup. The Wilson administration initiated an expansion of the Navy after the sinking of the RMS Lusitania by a German submarine, and Roosevelt helped establish the United States Navy Reserve and the Council of National Defense. In April of 1917, after Germany declared it would engage in unrestricted submarine warfare and attack several U.S. ships, Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war. Congress approved the declaration of war on Germany on April 6th. 
Franklin Roosevelt requested that he be allowed to serve as a naval officer, but Wilson insisted that he continue to serve as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. For the next year, Roosevelt remained in Washington to coordinate the mobilization, supply, and deployment of naval vessels and personnel. In the first six months after the U.S. entered the war, the Navy expanded fourfold. In the summer of 1918, Roosevelt traveled to Europe to inspect naval installations and meet with French and British officials. In September, he returned to the United States on board the USS Leviathan, Leviathan, a large troop carrier. On the 11-day voyage, the pandemic influenza virus struck and killed many on board. Roosevelt became very ill with influenza and a complicating pneumonia, but he recovered by the time the ship landed in New York. After Germany signed an armistice in November of 1918, surrendering and ending the fighting, Daniels and Roosevelt supervised the demobilization of the Navy. Against the advice of older officers such as Admiral William Benson, who claimed he could not conceive of any use the fleet will ever have for aviation. Roosevelt personally ordered the preservation of the Navy's aviation division. With the Wilson administration coming to an end, Roosevelt began planning for his next run for office. Roosevelt and his associates approached Herbert Hoover about running for the 1920 Democratic presidential nomination with Roosevelt as his running mate. There you go. Pretty cool stuff, leading us all the way up to uh, 1920 now. So Roosevelt's plan to convince Hoover to run for the Democratic nomination fell through after Hoover publicly declared himself to be a Republican. But Roosevelt nonetheless decided to seek the 1920 vice presidential nomination. After Governor James M. Cox of Ohio won the party's presidential nomination at the 1920 Democratic National Convention, he chose Roosevelt as his running mate, and the party formally nominated Roosevelt by acclamation. Although his nomination surprised most people, Roosevelt balanced the ticket as a moderate, a Wilsonian, and a prohibitionist with a famous name. Roosevelt had just turned 38, four years younger than Theodore had been when he received the same nomination from his party. Roosevelt resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and the Democrat, after the Democratic Convention, and he campaigned across the nation for the Cox-Roosevelt ticket. During the campaign, Cox and Roosevelt defended the Wilson administration and the League of Nations, both of which were unpopular in 1920. Roosevelt personally supported U.S. membership in the League of Nations, but unlike Wilson, he favored compromising with Senator Henry Cabot Lodge and other reservationists. Warren G. Uh, I'm sorry, the Cox Roosevelt ticket was defeated by Republicans Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge in the presidential election by a wide margin, and the Republican ticket carried every state outside of the South. Roosevelt accepted the loss without issue and later reflected that the relationships and goodwill that he built in the 1920 campaign proved to be a major asset in his 1932 campaign. The 1920 election also saw the first public participation of Eleanor Roosevelt, who, with the support of Lewis Howe, established herself as a valuable political ally. So there you go. Pretty uh, interesting. After the election, Roosevelt returned to New York City where he practiced law and served as a vice president of the Fidelity and Deposit Company. He also sought to build support for a political comeback in the 1922 elections, but his career was derailed by his illness. While the Roosevelts were vacationing at Campo Bello Island in August of 1921, Franklin Roosevelt fell ill. His main symptoms were fever, symmetric, ascending paralysis, facial paralysis, bowel and bladder dysfunction, numbness, and hyper, hyper, hypertesia, hypertesia, and a descending pattern of recovery. 
Roosevelt was left permanently paralyzed from the waist down. He was diagnosed with polio at the time. Well, actually, he was diagnosed with poliomyelitis myelitis at the time. But his symptoms are now believed to be more consistent with Gullian barr syndrome, an autoimmune neuro- neuropathy with Roosevelt's do- which Roosevelt's doctors failed to consider as a diagnostic pi- possibility. Though his mother favored his retirement from public life, Roosevelt, his wife, and Roosevelt's close friend and advisor, Lewis Howe, were all determined that he con- could continue his political career. He convinced many people that he was improving, which he believed to be essential prior to running for public office again. He laboriously taught himself to walk short distances while wearing iron braces on his hips and legs by swiveling his torso, supporting himself with a cane. He was careful never to be seen using his wheelchair in public, and great care was taken to prevent any portrayal in the press that would highlight his disability. However, his disability was well known before and during his presidency and became a major part of his image. He usually appeared in public standing upright, supported on one side by an aide or one of his sons. Beginning in 1925, Roosevelt spent most of his time in the southern United States. At first, on his houseboat, the Loraco or Luruco, intrigued by the potential benefits of hydrotherapy, he established a rehabilitation center at Warm Springs, Georgia, in 1926. To create the rehabilitation center, he assembled a staff of physical therapists and used most of his inheritance to purchase the Merriweather Inn. In 1938, he founded the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, leading to the development of the polio vaccines. Roosevelt maintained contacts with the Democratic Party during the 1920s, and he remained active in New New York politics while also establishing contacts in the South, particularly in Georgia. He issued an open letter endorsing Al Smith's successful campaign in New York's 1922 gubernatorial election, which both aided Smith and showed Roosevelt's continuing relevance as a political figure. Roosevelt and Smith came from different backgrounds and never fully trusted one another, but Roosevelt supported Smith's progressive policies while Smith was happy to have the backing of the prominent and well-respected Roosevelt. Roosevelt gave presidential nominating speeches for Smith at the 1924 and 1928 Democratic National Conventions. The speech at the 1924 convention marked a return to public life following his illness and convalescence. That year, the Democrats were badly divided between an urban wing, led by Smith, and a conservative rural wing, led by William Gibbs McAdoo. On the 101st ballot, the nomination went to John W. Davis, a compromise candidate who suffered a landslide defeat in the 1924 presidential election. Like many others throughout the United States, Roosevelt did not abstain from alcohol during the Prohibition era, but publicly he sought to find a compromise on Prohibition acceptable to both wings of the party. In 1925, Smith appointed Roosevelt to the Taconic State Park Commission, and his fellow commissioners chose him as chairman. In this role, he came into conflict with conflict with Robert Moses, a Smith protege who was the primary force behind the Long Island State Park Commission and the New York State Council of Parks. Roosevelt accused Moses of using the name recognition of prominent individuals, including Roosevelt, to win political support for state parks, but then diverting funds to the ones Moses favored on Long Island while Moses worked to block the appointment of Howe to a salaried position as the Taconic Commission Secretary. Roosevelt served on the commission until the end of 1928, and his contentious relationship with Moses continued as their careers progressed. So now that leads us up to him being governor of New York from 1929 to 1932. As the Democratic Party 
presidential nominee in the 1928 election, Smith, in turn, asked Roosevelt to run for governor in the state election. Roosevelt initially resisted the uh, the, the, the proposal of Smith, uh, wanting him to run, and others within the party, as he was reluctant to leave Warm Springs and feared a Republican landslide in 1928. He agreed to run when party leaders convinced him that only he could defeat the Republican gubernatorial nominee, New York Attorney General Albert Ottinger. Roosevelt won the party's gubernatorial nomination by acclamation, and he once again turned to Howe to lead his campaign. Roosevelt was also joined on the campaign trail by Samuel Rosenman, Francis Perkins, and James Farley, all of whom would become important political associates. While Smith lost the presidency in a landslide and was defeated in his home state, Roosevelt was elected governor by a 1% margin. Roosevelt's election as governor of the most populous state immediately made him a contender in the next presidential election. Upon taking office in January of 1929, Franklin Roosevelt proposed the construction of a series of hydroelectric power plants and sought to address the ongoing farm crisis of the 1920s. Relations between Roosevelt and Smith suffered after Roosevelt chose not to retain key Smith appointees like Moses. Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor established a political understanding that would last for the duration of his political career. She would serve as the governor's wife, but would also be free to pursue her own agenda and interests. He also began holding fireside chats in which he directly addressed his constituents via radio, often using these chats to pressure the New York State Legislature to advance his agenda. In October of 1929, the Wall Street crash occurred and the country began sliding into the Great Depression. While President Herbert Hoover and many state governors believed that the economic crisis would subside, Roosevelt saw the seriousness of the situation and established a state employment commission. He also began the first governor, he also became the first governor to publicly endorse the idea of unemployment insurance. When Roosevelt began his run for a second term in May of 1930, he reiterated his doctrine from the campaign two years before, that progressive government by its very terms must be a living and growing thing, that the battle for it is never ending, and that if we let up for one single moment or one single year, not merely do we stand still but we fall back in the march of civilization. He ran on a platform called for aid to farmers, full employment, unemployment insurance, and old age pensions. His Republican opponent could not overcome the public's criticism of the Republican Party during the economic downturn, and Roosevelt was elected to a second term by a 14% margin. With the Herbert Hoover administration resisting proposals to directly address the economic crisis, Roosevelt proposed an economic relief package and the establishment of the Temporary Emergency Relief Administration to distribute those funds, led first by Jesse L. Strauss and then by Harry Hopkins. The agency assisted well over one-third of New York's population between 1932 and 1938. Roosevelt also began an investigation into corruption in New York City among the judiciary, the police force, and organized crime, prompting the creation of the Seabury Commission. Many public officials were removed from office as a result. And that leads us up to the 1932 presidential election. Just going to read you some fun facts about his early life. Uh, some of these, th these things I've touched on, but I'll kind of just go over it, um, keeping it in the family. Franklin Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor were actually fifth cousins. Once removed, Eleanor's surname was already Roosevelt, and her uncle was no less than Theodore Roosevelt. Reportedly, when Franklin and Eleanor married in 1905, Teddy Roosevelt took a day off from the White House to walk his niece down the aisle 
and Teddy Roosevelt famously quipped, Well, Franklin, there's nothing like keeping the name in the family. We can assume, it being Teddy Roosevelt, the he that he had ridden to the wedding on a moose. Uh, that's pretty funny. Um, despite his presidential cousin the, and most of his family belonging to the Republican Party, Roosevelt joined the Democratic Party when he decided that a law career wasn't as promising as a political one. Uh, we knew that. I, I had touched on that. Um, when Roosevelt was actually just eight years old, he got into the habit of collecting stamps. Um, so his hobby became the salvation of his sanity as he was bedridden for a long time during his illness. He even said that stamp collecting contributed to saving his life during that hard time. Um, so pretty interesting. Um, just trying to see if there's anything else here. Uh, let me see. He continued, uh, he continued the Roosevelt legacy of political reform. Although he was a Republican, Teddy Roosevelt fought for workers' rights against corporate monopolies and promoted a square deal and created vast swaths of public lands for conservation and natural wonder. As a Democrat, Franklin Roosevelt did him one better. He created Social Security and unveiled multiple domestic programs under the premise of a social safety net and humanitarianism. We're going to get into all that, of course, more in part two. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. His first run at national office ended in a big loss. We touched on that. When the Democrats nominated Ohio Governor James M. Cox as its nominee for president in the 1920 election, FDR became the party's vice presidential nominee, and the Cox-Roosevelt ticket flopped with Americans. A whopping 60% of the popular vote went to President Warren Harding, along with three-quarters of the electoral votes. Um, it's just pretty crazy. Um, here we go. He had romantic affairs in spite of his reputation as a family man. As Franklin rose in politics, Eleanor had a hard time balancing the demands of public life and those of being a wife who pleased her husband. Following a miscarriage, the pair would go on to have five children, but the president would still maintain other relationships with women behind closed doors. One was the First Lady's own secretary, Lucy Mercer, whose involvement with the president caused Eleanor to offer a divorce. Franklin would have none of it. Furthermore, complicating the issue, his massive inheritance depended on the survival of their marriage. And then FDR's own secretary, Missy Lahand, was included in his will after she suffered a stroke. The two had a long-standing affair, and she remained one of the president's closest confidants. Um, so there you go there. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, right? Um, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. Uh... I think that's kind of, I, I, I want to say that's it. Here we go, Franklin Roosevelt. No, nope. here we go. In 1921, Franklin Roosevelt uh, atypically contracted polio, a disease that leaves the victim paralyzed. FDR subsequently removed himself from the political landscape and instead focused on his rehabilitation. Roosevelt exercised constantly, even when surrounded by loved ones, and incorporated his family into his daily regiments. Roosevelt did not convey shame due to his inability to walk, and the people elected him to the governorship of New York in 1928 before he became president in 1932. You know, we just touched on all that. That was pretty cool. Here we go. Uh, these are some facts about young Franklin Roosevelt. Young Franklin was an only child of very wealthy parents. He grew up in the estate in New York's Hudson Valley. Uh, so as we know... Uh, yeah, Franklin and Teddy were fifth cousins. Uh, they were fifth cousins, so they had the same great, 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 great grandparents. In this case, the distant relative was Nicholas Roosevelt, who lived from 1658 to 1742. Theodore was related to one of Nicholas's sons, while Franklin was related to a second son. Young Franklin Roosevelt was also related to his own wife, Eleanor, who was Theodore Roosevelt's brother's daughter. Um, we knew that, of course. Young Franklin also reportedly had a hard time adjusting to school. He was taught at home on the family estate until the age of 14, and when Franklin was sent to prep school at Groton, or Groton, he later went to Harvard. 
At the same time, he rekindled a relationship with Eleanor, and the two became uh, engaged, of course, in 1903. Uh, as a college student, Roosevelt was average academically, but very, very active socially. He was editor of the college newspaper, he graduated in three years, and later passed his bar exam uh, without finishing his law degree. Um, we know about that. Um, when Roosevelt ran for president in 1932, it wasn't his first appearance in the presidential ticket. We know of that. Um, we know about him cr uh, contracting polio in 1921 while he was on vacation in Canada. He remained paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life. And with Eleanor Roosevelt's support, Roosevelt didn't give up his political career. Um, and in recent years, there are researchers who aren't convinced that Roosevelt's paralysis was caused by polio. A recent study appearing in the Journal of Medical Biography said the future president most likely suffered from Gullian Barr syndrome or Gillian or Gillian Barr syndrome. But even if Roosevelt's doctors had known he had Gillian Barr, the treatment in 1921 would have been the same. An FDR diagnosed with Gillian Barr would have little to gain over one diagnosed with polio due to, to a deficit in possible treatments, uh, the article concluded. And finally, the journal article points out by misdiagnosing Roosevelt's condition as polio, the eventual attention to the illness saved countless lives. As president, Roosevelt championed efforts to wipe out polio in programs like the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and the March of Dimes. Um, and of course, in the 1950s, the Jonas Salk vaccine ended the polio threat. So it's just some uh, other fun facts about him. As I had mentioned, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he did have a half-brother. He was the only child of Sarah Delano and James Roosevelt, but he was not, however, his father's only child. James Roosevelt did have a much older son, also named James, from his first marriage to Rebecca Breen Howland. FDR's brother, who was nicknamed Rosie, was born in 1854, the same year as FDR's mother. By the time FDR was born in 1882, Rosie was already grown up and had a family. He had married into another of America's leading families when Rosie wed Helen Astor in 1877. FDR and Rosie's daughter Helen and son James were even close in age. He played with them when Rosie's family visited Springwood, the family estate in Hyde Park, New York. As I said, he collected stamps. It was a lifelong passion. Uh, he started up with the hobby at around age eight. Roosevelt's mother encouraged this activity, having been a collector herself as a child. And we, when FDR contracted polio in 1921, he turned to his stamps as a distraction during his bedridden days. In fact, he once said, I owe my life to my hobbies, especially stamp collecting. Um, we know he dropped out of law school. Um, we already said that. He married his fifth cousin. Um... So yeah, so uh, so there's just some more things. I'm just trying to just double check, make sure I'm covering everything here. Um, he was an avid collector. I'll read a little more of that. Um, he, he Roosevelt had a lifelong affair with postage stamps. He started collecting them as a child and later attended stamp shows. He bought rarities from stamp dealers and joined stamp clubs. He even designed a, designed a few stamps himself. Uh, or ornithology and collecting birds was another passion of his. Young Roosevelt received a BB gun on his 11th birthday. He then shot, stuffed, and mounted birds of about 300 different species in his native Dutchess County, New York. FDR also loved to go bird watching even while president. Um, so pretty interesting. As we know, he could have ran on the same ticket as Herbert Hoover. Uh, but Hoover decided to be a uh, Republican, and we know the rest of that story. Um, let me think here. I think that's kind of it uh, as far as his early life. Um, oh, this is interesting. Roosevelt was distantly related to both his wife and 11 other presidents. An only child with maternal roots dating back to the Mayflower Franklin Delano Roosevelt spent a privileged childhood in Hyde Park, New York, prior to attending an elite Massachusetts boarding school. 
He then enrolled in Harvard College, where he began courting another Roosevelt, Anna Eleanor, his fifth cousin once removed, as well as the niece and goddaughter of his fifth cousin, then President Theodore Roosevelt, whom FDR greatly admired. When the couple married in 1905, Theodore Roosevelt took a break from the White House duties to give Eleanor away in lieu of her deceased father. Well, Franklin, the president purportedly exclaimed at the wedding, there's nothing like keeping the name in the family. Though Theodore was his closest relative to head the country, FDR claimed to have traced his family tree to 10 other presidents as well. Pretty crazy. Uh, he had a little love uh, for the law. After Harvard, FDR went on to Columbia Law School, where he promptly flunked contracts and civil procedure and had to make up the classes over the summer. Franklin Roosevelt was not much of a student and nothing of a lawyer afterwards, one professor later recalled. He didn't appear to have any aptitude for the law and made no effort to overcome that handicap by hard work. In fact, Roosevelt didn't even stick around to get his degree. He left Columbia in 1907 upon passing the bar exam. Family connections landed him a job at Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, a prestigious New York City firm. But although he had some minor successes there, he never quite took to the profession, preferring instead to talk politics. Luckily, his family connections also brought him into contact with local Democratic leaders who in 1910 backed his successful campaign for a New York State Senate seat. So we, uh, he definitely wasn't into to the law. Um, so there you go. That's pretty much it. That's the early life, childhood. Uh, the birthplace is right there at Hyde Park. You're going to see all those pictures and everything in part two. Um, you know, I, th I showed some pictures of, you know, older pictures of Hyde Park uh, in this video, but I'll show you my pictures in part two. Um, but that was it. That's the uh, life pretty much leading up to the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, our 32nd president of the United States. I hope you enjoyed this part one, his look at his young life, childhood, early political career, and all of that. And now tomorrow, part two, the presidency of FDR, the very long presidency of FDR. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for all the support. Thank you. Keep the comments and questions coming. Go take that survey on my YouTube page. All of it. Thank you, guys. You're the best. And we will see you tomorrow for part two. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. How's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And today is Monday, June 14th. So... You're probably seeing these videos and stuff on, uh, you know, Thursday or Friday of this week. So, I mean, this was taken just this past Monday. This video as you're seeing, and you see I'm in a cemetery uh, behind me right there. I'm going to flip you guys around. This is actually the St. James Episcopal Churchyard up in Hyde Park, New York. And what we are walking toward right now is actually the gravesite of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's father and mother, which is actually right there. So we're going to go take a look here at that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool place up here. This is Hyde Park. I'm right down the street from uh, where Franklin's buried. But as you see here, here's Sarah Delano Roosevelt. That's Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mother. So that is FDR's mother right there. Um, let me see here. That's actually Sarah Delano Roosevelt. I think that's actually like a sister or something because uh, it was only 14 years old. I actually have to check that because I'm curious about that. Um, but I will check that for you guys. So, yeah, here you go. Sarah Delano Roosevelt. That's uh, Franklin's mother right there. Um, and then over here... This is Franklin's father. So, nope, that is not. That's Rebecca. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Here we go. There's James. So that's his father. That's his mother and father right there. Um, pretty cool stuff. 
And uh, yeah, I'm going to show you some other really cool things uh, in this cemetery here. Um, but definitely cool. Uh, this now I'm also going to show you here right next to them. As you see, there they are. And then right here, right next to them. This is actually Franklin's son. This is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or I believe it's Delano Jr. Uh, this is Franklin's son right here, though. So you got FDR's son, FDR's father, and FDR's mother right over here. So pretty cool stuff. Up here at the uh, St. James Episcopal Churchyard. Uh, so I will uh, check back in in a second for you guys. All right, guys, TJ back with you. So I figured out the mystery. This right here, that's actually Franklin Roosevelt's granddaughter. Uh, that was the uh, daughter of his son, John Roosevelt. Uh, she apparently um, had a very bad fall, I believe, off a horse, I want to say. Injuries from a fall off a horse. So, um, yeah, that's actually Franklin's granddaughter right here. Uh, and she was, as you see, she was actually... Um, only 13 years old when she died almost 14 so that's who that is right next to um franklin's mother and father here so just wanted to touch on that and then yes as i said so here you go as i said franklin's father franklin's mother here this right here is actually franklin's father's first wife that's rebecca howland roosevelt so that's his first wife right here uh, buried here so pretty interesting stuff and then like I said and then here's his son over here so then this should be maybe I'm wrong but one of these should be his half brother uh, no that's Helen dun, dun, dun. here we go yep I'm pretty sure this is him right here so here you go. This is also now Franklin's half-brother, James Roosevelt, better known as Rosie. So this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt's half-brother. Uh, this was uh, the son of uh, Franklin's father and his first wife that I just showed you her grave, uh, Rebecca. Uh, so this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt's FDR's half-brother, his gravesite as well, so... And as you see, they're all right here. You know, there's there's Franklin's parents right back there. So it's all right here. So there you go. So this right here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's infant son, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who died when he was only seven months old. So right here, that is Franklin's uh, son, who died when he was only seven months old. Very sad. So, guys, right here, I'm still in that same plot area. There's Franklin's parents, his son, um, his other infant son right there. So right here is actually his daughter, Anna. And I literally, I mean, my hand's all filthy because of it. I had to just pick all of this apart because this was covered over. All these vines and, you know, these plants here, this was completely, you could not even see it. I had to go buy pictures on find a grave and to realize that she was right here. So this is the grave of Anna, who is Franklin and Eleanor's daughter. So there you go. Another one of Franklin's kids right here. So again, so we had Anna right here, FDR and Eleanor's daughter. Uh, we had their infant son, Franklin, right here. And then right behind me, same thing I had to do with Anna. I had to pull all these bu bushes off. And you have John Aspinwall Roosevelt. This is actually FDR and Eleanor's son, another one of their sons. So this is John Aspinwall Roosevelt. So yet another child of FDR and Eleanor's right here in this Roosevelt family plot area here in the uh, Episcopal Churchyard in Hyde Park. <laughs> 